domestic violence one of the most rampant forms of violence but also a subject that is always kept under wraps within the walls of the heart and home and more often it's the women who bear the brunt of this form of subjugation domestic violence has been on the rise in our modern societies today especially due to the stress and strain of modern living the workload in the workplace the pressure of balancing both home and work and parenting in a nuclear family setup all add up to the pent up frustration which often leads to the build up of toxicity in the family household thus leading to domestic violence it should however be understood that domestic violence is not restricted to physical abuse only verbal abuse and emotional abuse also count as domestic violence with the setting up of the domestic violence act by the government in 2005 we have seen the reports of many domestic violence abuse cases coming out into the open which would otherwise been unreported with the onset of the pandemic since last year the rise of domestic violence cases has gone up with families scooped up together within their homes because of the lockdown patience wears thin and this ultimately blows up into domestic violence there have been reports of physical abuse and other forms of abuse by men in the form of domestic rape physical beatings and alcohol induced abuse over their spouses in such a scenario women children and elderly parents often face the trauma and are at the receiving end being the physically weaker gender in order to create awareness about helplines and other care centers or shelter homes as they are called for abused women many ngos and the government have come up with such support aids to help those in need it is time that we as a society and especially as women come together and help one another to tide through these tough times so that we create a safe space for the abused and a healthy mindset for the abuser A warm welcome to each one of you, all our viewers. And uh, today we have among us two uh, established panelists in our very program, The Rise of Domestic Violence Against Women During Pandemic. We all know that domestic violence is such a recurring um, you know, issue. But how much do we know about it, especially during pandemic, where the victims or the, survi the so-called survivors become confined within their you know, area? especially with their perpetrator. So today, as we start our discussion, I would like to introduce to all our viewers, Ms. Joy Grace CM, someone who has been advocating for women's and child rights and is currently engaged with Northeast Network. She has a vast experience ranging from being a trainer, a legal counsel, and also a researcher. She has had international degrees and she's been working with international organizations also. A very warm welcome, Ms. Joy. Thank you. Then our second panelist, Mr. Noel James, is a psychological therapist based in Shillong who's a professional affiliated with British Psychological Society and is also a member of Meghalaya Progressive Counselors Union, MPCU. He, and he specializes in PTSD, OCD, depression, panic disorder, among few, many more issues. A very warm welcome. Thanks so much. So as we start our program today, I would first like to put up a question to Ms. Joy. Joy, see, we always talk about uh, domestic violence. And it is every day when we see a newspaper or we check out news, you know, we read headlines. What I would like for my viewers to understand simple meaning of what domestic violence is. If okay. you could please elaborate and explain to our audience. Right. So, uh, in India, we have uh, a law that was, uh, you know, that came into force in 2005 and it is known as the Protection of Women Against Domestic Violence. And as per this act, uh, domestic, you know, usually people always think when we say domestic violence means, oh, he must have hit me. You know, there must have been some physical force then it would be domestic violence. But as per this act, domestic violence also encompasses economic abuse, okay, 
it uh, encompasses sexual, emotional, mental and verbal abuse as well. So uh, that uh, understanding that usually, you know, and that mindset that we have, oh, that, oh, you know, I can't file a case of domestic violence. He never hit me, uh, but he doesn't give me money. You know, he doesn't give me money to maintain my children or to maintain myself. Right. That's not domestic violence, right? That's the question we get a lot in the field. But now we've been able to file a number of cases based on, uh, because, of the, because of this law. So we've been able to file many more cases of verbal, sexual abuse, and also here in Meghalaya, actually, there has been a lot of domestic violence cases uh, ranging in the economic abuse, uh, within the economic abuse definition. Thank you so much for saying that. And also, I would like to ask you, who do you think, like you, when you've said that, oh, my husband has not hit me. Right. Right. Okay, that is one uh, of way of defining what um, domestic violence is. But to our viewers, I would like you to explain that, and for them, for they have to have a better understanding that who can come under the purview of this law. I think that is very important. We know what the law is now. Right. You said that, yes, it doesn't entail to only physical hitting, and especially in Meghalaya, in our own state, we have economic challenges because of, you know, and cases are rising, domestic violence cases rising because of economic violence. So, would you kindly explain to our viewers who come under the purview of domestic violence? Right, and uh, that is also something else that, that's why some, when I do awareness programs, you know, as Northeast Network, we carry a number of awareness programs on the PWDVA, as we call it. Uh, we don't call it so much domestic violence more than, more than intimate partner violence. Okay, and that's because uh, sometimes when we say domestic violence, like you said, immediately you think that there has to be a marriage contract, right? And that only married women would fall under the purview of the PWDVA. But um, as, per this, uh, as per the Domestic Violence Act, uh, you see that it also, any woman who is in an intimate partnership or intimate relationship with a man would fall under the purview of the PWDVA and therefore could file a case of domestic violence. So is it only intimate? Because uh, if I am to understand, domestic violence also entails, it could be a family too. Yeah, it could also include, it does not necessarily mean that it has to be, you know, with your, uh, with your husband, but could also be family members themselves as well. Okay. So uh, thank you so much for that. I would like to put up a question to Noel now. Since you've got the idea of what domestic violence is and who are entitled, from your perspective, how much have you seen or have come across, generally speaking, cases where survivors needed counselling or they were in a traumatic stage where they were asked to t seek help? Yes, I come to that, Supa, actually. It's a very normal response really, that I've actually seen. They've t trauma is so normalised yeah, domestic violence is so common, like we've actually seen such high rates. Response to it is very, very common. And it's underplayed often when you actually have people come speak about uh, having insomnia, sleeplessness and things symptomatically. Oh, it's just that, yeah, there's something wrong with you, probably. Yeah, you should just shake it off. Maybe, yeah, you've just been spending too much time with the mobile phone. Yeah, or you just... And it's things like that, really. So when we're actually looking at the question that you've actually asked, there are so many cases, but the funny thing is that even when service users enter into a therapeutic contract, many a times they're not very comfortable actually discussing about this. Hmm. This so is a big challenge, I yeah. think. Because I think today, even when we talk about domestic violence, we want to create an awareness. One of the challenges we face is especially trauma-related counselling. Yeah. This is something we address the, see has, um, Joy has said, yes, there are legalities and, you know, legal provisions in there. But what about psychological help? What about counselling? What about trauma related, you know, issues that needs to be addressed? How you said very rightly, it is still a taboo. So as long as it's a legal thing, it's fine. The moment someone says you need to go for uh, counselling because of the kind of abuse varying from any degrees in what she had given an example in Meghalaya especially it's economic people think it's just economic they didn't pay you but the trauma can be everlasting mm. to think of each of your meal can you pay for it or whom do you ask for it when you're dependent to your child if it's, it's a spousal case or to your parents or from your siblings so I think it's a 
it's a really, really traumatic experience. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I think it is very, very less addressed. Yeah. What are your opinions on that? Yeah, it's underplayed, isn't it? Like I said, again, an, a point that you've actually brought up, so important. Yeah, not many people actually have the awareness for it. So they don't really know what they're going through. Yes. They're not aware of the law. Even if they are aware of the law, mental health is just downplayed, really. So, yeah, it's not as important as physical health. So when you'd actually ha have a stomachache, you'd go to a doctor, you're more than happy to. When you have depression or you are actually a survivor of domestic violence, yeah, you wouldn't really want to go and speak about it because there's so many other factors really in play. Yes, so as a psychologist, do you think awareness and talking about, like today we're having a session and I hope our viewers will take it and it'll be helpful in some way or the other for them to understand that it's okay if you're going through a trauma, it's let's not normalize trauma, but address it to make it normal. Yep. I think that is, you know, in a very way to put it, because when we normalize trauma, that means we accept that trauma is okay for us. We, we cannot talk about it. But when we try to normalize that, yeah, trauma is there, we need to address it, then we come into, I mean, if you, you know, you could add some pointers to that, is that then you say that, yes, I'm, uh, you acknowledge that you have been traumatized and you seek help. So there's a vast difference. So do you think awareness and capacity building training, especially when you say service providers also, first point of contact, it is very important. And can you just give us a little bit of idea as to how one can go about it? So if you're looking at, so then I, I would actually have to make this more of like safety planning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so something we call safety planning intervention when you're looking at cases of trauma. One would be alerting emergency contacts and any, any first responders really, you can have the police in there, you can have medical practitioners, you can have a neighbor who you trust, anyone really, first right. responders and then emergency services. And if you've been uh, subjected to abuse in the past, it's very, very good idea at this point of time, really, to keep all of your necessities yeah, in certain places, yeah, in another place as well, where you can actually, a safe place where you can actually ret retire to, yeah, right. should abuse ever take place. Another very important thing I would say is that if, you're frequent, if there's frequent abuse, really, and domestic violence, try and actually let the dispute really happen in a place that actually has open locations where you can easily escape, really, from the room right. and things like that. All right. Thank you so much. That's a very good plan. It's just like a backup. You know, it's like yeah. a safety plan, which you said. But when it comes to awareness, do you, don't you think more awareness needs to be done? Because acknowledging the safety plan is a second option. Mm -hmm. But the first, we have to realize that we are getting traumatized. Yeah, that, that's so the capacity building part. Really. It's very important yeah. because I think a lot of people and I'm sure as, an, as a lay person, even I wouldn't know where to go. Mm -hmm. You know, I know there is a law. I know that, uh, uh, you know, OK, fine. But where do I go? And I think one of the challenges now I would like to put forward, you know, a question more like a query mm -hmm. to address is that uh, when you talk about domestic violence, we usually assume that it is a rural sector or it's only happening in a certain class of people, economic certain class of people because of alcoholism, various factors, which even, even she has said. Having said that, now, and you being a point of contact and having dealt with these cases, I mean, you see a lot of urban cases are happening but the challenge becomes when they again not lack of knowledge but lack of trust in the system and also um, the whole taboo and this you know acknowledging the very fact that people will talk I think that's another challenge what would you like to add on that yeah of course the stigma uh, you know is uh, the number one uh, kind of barrier for women Right. why they don't want to report about it and it's stigma to oneself you know my honor because you know here in india the woman carries honor hmm. right honor is carried in her name and so therefore uh she doesn't want to hurt her family's name and you know all of that yeah like you said i mean usually people always think oh yeah domestic violence you know it happens in the rural places and things exactly. like that or at the village level maybe uh, but from what I've seen, I mean, I've been practicing for the last seven years, at least here in Meghalaya. And I think that actually in the urban centers, we have a higher rate of domestic violence. But those are, or we also have a higher rate of unreported mm. cases that is of something domestic very violence. Important, yes. Whereas domestic violence is reported 
quite frequently from the rural, at least from what I've seen in Northeast Network. At the rural areas, the women still report cases you know of domestic violence of sexual abuse okay but in the urban areas that's where we've had a lot of challenges actually because the women will come they will speak to us and say yes i you know i i'm i'm facing domestic violence you know at at an everyday level and when we look at domestic violence first and foremost uh it's not a social welfareist issue okay it's a public health issue because mm. Once you face domestic violence, you're going to face a number of health issues that also come with that. Uh, and the other thing being that uh, it's not about reporting it. I think this word reporting also has just too much legal implication. Because when you tell a woman, oh, you have to report a case of domestic violence, they think, oh, you know, they're going to make me go to the police. They're going to make me, you know, do all of that. Right. Uh, so I, I, what we tell our women in our awareness programs is come talk about it, hmm. you know, talk about it to your counsellors, talk about it to organisations working on violence against women and we will hold your hand if at all you should wish to report it formally. Right. There are two ways of how, you know, you, you become a survivor of domestic violence, okay, and I understand that uh, you know, we come with a feminist ideology and so therefore you have to give a woman who has faced domestic violence or any form of violence, first you have to give them onus to take control of their life again. You don't want to sit there with a, with a victim and say, now you must do this, you must do that, you must do that. You're taking away her, her authority, her decision making right. power. All her life she's been abused, that has already been taken away from her. Her right. voice, her autonomy, you know, her agency. So the first thing as people, as first responders to victims of violence is we need to work to give them back their agency. Right. That's the first healing process. Uh, and that is why I always used to, even when we were with our barefoot counsellors and when I do trainings with the police and everyone, I always say that don't immediately talk about the legalities of it. Right give the woman back her agency to make that choice because the law now gives us a criminal procedure and a civil procedure and if a woman feels uncomfortable with going to court and going to police there is a civil option right you know uh, to seek justice uh, under do for domestic violence right. so give women back that agency to choose how they want to reclaim back their lives but what is important is getting them out of that violent situation and getting them back to stand on I their I think you've made a very poignant issue and a very poignant point that yes, because yes, we are there to handhold you, but you also have to make that decision making. Yes. Because the moment you say, which you very rightly said, the moment um, someone says that, oh, you need to report, mm. they just think that, okay, if they might be urban educated, may, they might not be working, they might be dependent on their husband or in rural case, whatsoever. The moment someone says that, like how you have said, pointed out that the moment they say you have to register a case or file a report, they feel that the only earning or dependent person goes off. Mm. You know, that's the first basic instinct which strikes in and then that's how they stop reporting. So I think that is a very, um, you know, a holistic way of approaching. I think, yes, the laws are there to help us when and if we need, but I think uh, approaching it in a holistic way to come and give a better because for us as individuals as a citizen or as someone who's surviving or I think it's more important that we come up with a solution addressing mm -hmm. the issue than making it more punishment oriented for right. the uh, whoever is a perpetrator I think that is something you know one I hope our viewers can understand and take that it's very very important yeah as you have rightly pointed out along those lines as a process of healing coming from your expertise i think mm -hmm. healing is a long process for an individual uh, healing process is a difficult thing yeah. but what better you know at least in uh, besides counseling do you think for a survivor or a victim what in a holistic approach when we're going on that line could be a better approach for them to you know heal or to use that method of healing for them. Right. Thank you for actually bringing that up. And yeah, 
just to actually continue the conversation, the last part. And yeah, I just want to make it very, very clear at this point of time that violence is not a loss of control. Yeah, violence is very much behavior exhibited to gain control over someone, to establish control over someone. It's not so much of a loss of control. And a part of this healing, really, is making people aware of this, giving them back their agency, and it's empowering them, really. And the part of the therapist, really, out there would be just to listen. Mm. It's really just listening. Right. So even if you're supporting the person, yeah, you're not really there to make any judgment calls, yeah, condemn it, no, nothing whatsoever at the start, at least. You're just there to listen to them, yeah? Ensure they're safe. And collab you did mention holistic work, so collaborating with other agencies is just so important at this point. Creating yes. a very strong support network. Right. Yeah. And leading victims to like agencies that actually support violent uh, that actually support survivors. Right. The domestic violence. The process of healing can be long. Again it, and it's very, very individual I would mm. say. Yes. It's very, very individual. Again, we touched on this earlier because of the plethora of comorbid disorders that actually might entail it. Yes. You can have anything from depression, anxiety, panic disorder. A lot of factors coming into panic it. Panic disorder. Yes. And sometimes it could really be, it could really maintain, it could really maintain uh, the this victim identity, development of a victim identity. Yeah. That, c or it could also develop, uh, it could also lead to the development of uh, maybe an abusive personality, really. Right. And then you're seeing, it as far as looking at mental health disorders and working with these disorders are concerned, you're looking at the probably an antisocial personality disorder. Right. You're looking at high functioning autism. Yeah. There are a lot of various factors. Various factors. Which and uh, can and, um, you know, impact a yeah, person. Because it can, actually, absolutely. it can actually unlock a lot of mental health conditions and really, do you, do you, I can't really say for sure, like there would be a particular duration for right. treatment. Yeah, but the sooner the person really realizes and no longer lives in denial that yes. yeah, I'm not a victim of violence. Yes. Yeah, the sooner th the fa the sooner that happens, yeah, the acceptance of that happens, then you're on your way to healing. Really. Right. Thank you so much. And in today's time, especially in pandemic, you know, uh, it is so important, and that is why we are having this discussion because in Meghalaya rest of the world leaving alone in Meghalaya itself we are seeing because of pandemic how I've introduced the program is that our survivors or the victims in most cases during COVID times are restricted or confined with their perpetrators so coming to part of that how do you think pandemic has affected you know obviously has it been a positive or a negative impact or has it helped or people are getting more um, you know, aggressive, the perpetrators during this time? Or are there enough helplines to actually reach out? Enough is being, I know I'm accumulating it in a very mm -hmm. wholesome way. So if you could address that, Joe. Uh, so I think during the pandemic, we all, we all know we saw a rise you know, in domestic violence cases mm -hmm. uh, worldwide. And then even here in Meghalaya itself, although I think we've not really worked out the statistics part of that, so I won't be able to give the number. Uh, I think the, the issue is we weren't, um, you know, we weren't prepared, we did not have a mechanism right. in place mm -hmm. uh, on how would we deal with, you know, violence cases, hmm. you know, when everyone was either locked down, restricted movement, and, you know, things Absolutely. like that. But here in Meghalaya, I think what was, um, you know, what we were lucky in a way is because of the roles that the Dorbash Nongs play hmm. at the local governance level. And we have done a lot of awareness programs, capacity building programs, uh, you know, with the different Dorbash Nongs and through them have formed what we call subcommittees of uh, women who address issues of violence against women within their own localities or within their own Dorbars. And apart from that, we also had, uh, you know, what we call barefoot counsellors. Mm -hmm. So these are women who have been trained on counselling and also trained on how to identify cases of violence. Okay. So what they did is even during the time of the pandemic, yes. uh, they were still able, able to check within the, you know, within the periphery of their neighbourhood at least uh, on cases of violence that were happening. And then it was taken up by the Dorbashna. 
So, are you trying to say even during pandemic, okay, reaching out, I understand, but pandemic makes, at least for the first few months, we were all confined to her. Yeah. So, then how did they bridge that gap, especially when you talk about rural areas, because A, communication, mm. electronic communication is very limited. So, how has it been, of course, it has been a challenge, even we see our students are facing challenge. But during pandemic, to for the because otherwise they're doing a fantastic job. But during pandemic specifically, what was there? You know, it will be very interesting. And so that, you know, see, we are still in that zone. I think for our viewers, it will be very important that they know that, okay, just because pandemic, I'm, and we, I'm locked up, or I cannot move in certain areas of confinement, you know, quarantine, I can still feel empowered and I can still reach out to people for help so if you could elaborate in what way they can help especially during pandemic these are very good mechanisms which you have talked yeah. about but how can an individual so suppose today i want to reach out and i don't have an access probably because obviously the perpetrator with the phone or even if i'm having a phone i might not have a smartphone so how do i reach out to especially if i'm confined in my own home due to pandemic restrictions yeah, I mean, of course, it does make it tough if you're not, a, you know, you're not able to use your phone. But what we have seen from the cases that, you know, we had yes. during the pandemic, and I mean, this was like at the peak of the lockdown time, is the women still could at least go and approach their second thing. Right. Because they were living in the same neighborhood, okay. next door neighbors, right. or, you know, the head man. Right. And that is why sensitizing people, making people yes. aware of domestic violence uh, is important because it's not only about reporting it it's about the woman at least being able to come out and seek help and help. the local governance at that level is able to then act and take up authority at least against the abuser yes you know because it was not possible for okay for them to call the helplines right. or you know for them to come to the police station or to go to the protection yes, officers absolutely right that was not possible right but having women at the community itself at the neighborhood level who other women could then reach out and speak about the violence they were facing it was and then helpful. once you know once the dorbarshno you know the group hmm. goes and they you know can uh, kind of apprehend the abuser i think that itself helps to a certain extent and hmm. so therefore a uh, community action and a community right. addressal and redressal mechanism actually uh, is very important during pandemic time. I think that's a very important point. Yeah. You mean? Like, see, when you start addressing and making a capacity building training from the grassroots level, it really helps. How do you think, as a counsellor, coming to the same question, you know, have you received more cases or are they still in... Yeah, quite in ...still in doubt or they are not being ha ha able to access? Yeah, I did mention that a lot of them were, weren't very, very forthcoming with this information. Right. Yeah, they, they actually come in with reports of like panic attacks. So one thing that I've worked with through the pandemic really is post-COVID crisis, hmm. post-COVID anxiety basically. A lot of them have actually developed it. And yeah, as the sessions really progress, somewhere out there it's just discovered that the person's actually, I, I will definitely use the term intimate partner violence. Right. Yeah, because it uh, encompasses so many other things. Absolutely. And yeah, we've realized there to be marital rape and things like that. Right. Just a lot of frustration, really. Yes. Yeah, from the part, uh, yeah, and, and out there, we've actually seen, like from my experience, I've actually noticed that people actually very, very, they're, they're not very forthcoming with this information. So really, one is because of language. Right. Yeah, one is because of language. Hmm. So I, I presently, I operate bilingual as a bilingual counselor, yeah. But what about the people in Shillong? Just looking at, just what about the people in Meghalaya? Yeah? How mm. many of them are actually made aware of mental health services that can actually cater to victims who are actually survivors of domestic violence? Right. Yeah, so yeah, awareness is definitely one. Trained personnel, just so important. Mm. Right. I would say more than really prepping the person who's actually survived it, I would say the people who are actually supporting them, th it's just so important for them to be well trained because it's a very sensitive matter. Yeah, and yeah, if you do something wrong, yeah, all of it just could really just go down. Absolutely. I know we have so much more to talk and you know it's such a vast topic but unfortunately we are running short of time but you know I hope we can continue with more programs like that. Just before we wind up can we just have a just say a one line out just a concluding remark from both of you. Joy please. Uh, yeah so I uh, 
I mean, I know, yeah, we could have spoken about so much more. Right. But uh, like I said uh, in, my, in the last uh, question you had asked me, I think a community uh, response uh, to domestic violence and other issues of gender-based discrimination uh, is really uh, the way forward uh, for us now. And uh, I hope that through this program, we are all made more aware, but also more sensitized towards the issues of gender-based discrimination. Thank you. Yeah, no, Judith, your last so parting words. If I actually had to conclude this program, and it's just been really a pleasure, yeah, I would just say, the more you speak about it, the more you speak up about it, yeah, the easier it's going to get for people to help you. You're not going to feel alone. You don't really have to go through all of it all by yourself. There are people here willing to help you. I think that's a very, very important thing, concluding remark of that, and I hope our viewers can take it, that you are not alone. You need to ask for help, and there are agencies, there are people. You need to find your voice. I think, you know, by, and it's, it's like I said again, I reiterate the fact we have so much more to know, but I hope our today's discussion was helpful in some way. And our viewers have taken at least few bits of it. When they go back, they can reflect, especially people who are in denial or are suffering or are actually unknowingly becoming victims of domestic violence. Even in pandemic situations like what we are going through, like how our panelists have said, Joy and Noel, there, are, there is a system. You just need to reach out, have confidence, feel free to voice it and reflect and it is not a taboo. If you're going through it, even how educated woman you are or you belong to a rural you know, area, every woman has the right to sp speak up, voice, without being judged. And let us break this taboo. Let us break this shaming and you know, ostracizing about it, shaming people that how can you come out and talk about a violence which is something very personal between four walls. No, it's not. It's a crime something we need to stand up for, something we need to voice. And I hope our viewers take that with us. To next program, I hope we'll have more discussions. Thank you, each one of you. It was a pleasure to have you both as a panelist. And thank you to our viewers. I hope this program leads you to find your voice. Thank you so much. <laughs>